I'm Jim Tessman, pastor of Oak Grove Baptist Church. Uh, with me is Adam Lewandowski, our music minister, uh, Reverend Trey Wooten, our children's minister, and Richard White, our senior adult and pastoral care pastor. I don't want to forget that. Uh, we're going through uh, today the Bible study for life uh, lesson for this week. I believe it's the March 22nd lesson, and it's about faith. Um, and the, the focal scripture that we're going to be looking at is uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, I believe. Um, I'd like to ask Trey to open us up in prayer, and we'll get right into the scripture. Yeah. Just, Father God, again, as we come to you today, and just thank you for this opportunity we have, Father, just to dig in the scripture together, God, that we can uh, share with uh, church families as well as many others who may be viewing this view the internet. God, we pray that the words we say today, God, will glorify and honor you. God, we pray to give us the, the guidance, God, to direct our discussion to honor you in all ways. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> all right. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So it well, I'm sorry, so through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. One of our, our prompts, uh, the, the questions of our Sunday school book, is what are some things you've never seen but still believe exists? Oxygen. <laughs> when? Coronavirus. <laughs> True. I would so put heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. Thank you, receive. Well, God, I mean, we, we haven't seen him. We know he exists. Well, it's funny when you said when, I had, I had jotted that down as a note. We can't see when, we can see its effects. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we can't see God himself, but we can see the effects of God. Right. And that's why Jesus became a man, so that we could see God. And that's, that's one thing that's what brings us well. God, but when I'm talking to children, um, and we talk about the word faith, uh, that's one of the things we talk about is faith and believing in something we cannot see. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of ask questions such as, you know, can we see God right now? But what can we see that God has made and mm -hmm. things like that that we can see? Yeah. Yeah. And I believe we can see God. I can see God in you, you and you. I can see God's work in my life and all around us. Well, the Bible says that men are without excuse. Um, and we suppress God's truth in unrighteousness. Right. Yeah, so you, you look at just the evidence of creation, and, and there he is. It's all over the place. Absolutely. So uh, I think if, if, we, if we study this uh, in, in context, the author has been has spent 10, uh, 10 chapters talking about you know, the, the supremacy of Christ and how Jesus is better than the old sacrificial system. And in and, and the last verse of uh, chapter 10, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere in their souls. And I think that when we look at what faith is, faith is a, is a demonstration of our perseverance, of our faith in God. Uh, I believe that you know, faith um, in, in Greek is an action word. It's, it's a verb. Faith is never something that we simply have. It's something that we display. 
and for the, the author of Hebrews, and, and I know there's a great controversy that you know, who, who wrote Hebrews? Uh, I, I know a guy who, who will roll up his sleeves and want to wrestle with you if you tell him that the Apostle Paul didn't write Hebrews. Well, every time Paul wrote a letter, he started out, you know, Paul, <laughs> a bond servant of Christ Jesus to the saints at wherever. Paul, there was Paul wrote in a very specific way, so I, I don't believe that Paul was the author of this. But the bottom line is, whoever the human author was is really irrelevant. Uh, the Bible is dual authorship. The Holy Spirit wrote the, the book of Hebrews, um, and so it really doesn't doesn't matter what man God used to, to do that. And it's interesting what we're picking up today in chapter eleven how the writer, whoever it may have been, spelled out the essence of living by faith. Uh, through the examples of Old Testament saints as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every every one of these Old Testament saints, if you will, these these uh, uh, folks that uh, are mentioned again and again throughout Scripture, they're they're uh, they foreshadow Jesus. They are what some people call types of Christ. What we see uh, in their lives a a uh, a projecting. Of what Jesus will come and do. Uh, Verse 1 and 2 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For for by it the people of old would receive their commendation. And uh, we see that word commendation, and it it made me think there's only two outcomes in life. Either we get uh, uh, condemnation or commendation. Uh, There is no third option. Either we're commended by God for our faith, or we are condemned by God for our lack of faith. On the day of judgment, the ones who, that have trusted in Jesus are going to be commended. Uh, those who have rejected Christ will be condemned. And, and it's interesting, I had an email, uh, I did a wedding a few months ago, and, and I got an email from one of the folks that were involved, and they said, uh, I want to share my faith. Uh, with my co-workers, but um, uh, I work with somebody that is you know, very intellectual and they like to poke holes and, and everything that I tell them. And they had a question was, if God is so gracious and loving, what happened to all the people uh, before Jesus came? How did they get saved? And I, I told her the same thing that we're reading here. Uh, they got saved the same way that we get saved today. Uh, through the grace of God, through faith in God. And that's what uh, the author of Hebrews is telling us today. Uh, Abel was commended by God. Enoch was commended by God. Um, and we are always saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these early saints, Jesus hadn't come yet. They were looking forward to him. We, we, we look back at the cross, we look back at the empty tomb, for our salvation, uh, because that is the news of the gospel, the, the, the gospel that saves us. Uh, that, that Jesus is God, he became a man, he lived a sinless life, he died on a cross for our sins, he was buried, according to 1 Corinthians 15, that he was, he was raised on the third day, uh, he has ascended to the right hand of the Father, one day he's come back to receive us unto himself. That's the good news of the gospel. We embrace that by faith. So we look back, but the Old Testament saints had to look forward. And they had to trust in God the same as us. God had promised in Genesis 3 that he was going to send a redeemer. And they looked and they waited and they watched and they had faith in God. Um, And that commended them to God. I have a note in my Bible about the commendation that says, it was a divine, divine approval of their faith, evidence in their bold acts of trust in the Lord. So, um, just right. you know, just like he said, that these people in this old in the Old Testament, they had uh, many of them had extreme faith. I would say called extreme faith mm-hmm. because they did not know or understand. What was going to happen in into the what we read in the New Testament? Sure. Um, so they had that faith in what these things that happened, such as we're reading here, 
And God just put this on their hearts to accept him without seeing him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Romans 4, Paul says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Now, what was that term he used? Extreme faith? Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham took his son, the son that he waited for 100 years, up on a mountain and was prepared to plunge a knife into his heart. Uh, that's extreme faith. It, it really is. Um, and he would have done it if he wasn't silent. Absolutely. <laughs> I believe that. I believe he would have done it. Um, you know, God is faithful. Uh, their faith in the Old Testament was a, a messianic uh, foreshadowing. That they, they trusted that God was going to provide the Redeemer that he promised. And, and so they hoped for things that were unseen. They hoped in this Messiah that had not yet come. And a whole lot of generations went by in faith. <laughs> it's not like you, you or I, we wait for something and we, we get upset when Amazon takes an extra day to deliver a package. <laughs> you know? uh, Guilty. Think about the, the Jews in, in the Old Testament days, you know, waiting for that Messiah and yet keeping their their faith through generations and generations. It's just it's it's an amazing example to us. I have a question for all of us in here, because I have a quote and I'll read that after <laughs> after this. <clears throat> what is the opposite of faith besides my unfaith or unbelief? Mm -hmm. um, Tony Evans, the, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is disobedience. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Well, yeah, Christians doubt all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But you still obey, even though you might doubt, you still obey. Right. Yeah, that's very profound. Uh, verse 3 says, By faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And, and this speaks right into the Christian worldview. Um, you know, we believe the word of God, and, and the theology of creation is, is found in Genesis 1 1, uh, all throughout the Bible. In fact, someone once said, In order to, to believe the Bible, you have to believe Genesis 1 1. That is the starting point of our faith, um, that the universe was created by God. Um, so, and I said Sunday in our other Bible study, the word science means knowledge. And no knowledge exists from what God has revealed to us. Um, science can't explain the arrival of life from non-life. Mm -hmm. And that's what they try to do. That is the that is they talk about the missing link as if it's you know some kind of a uh, Bigfoot character. The missing link is what's called abiogenesis, that life does not come from non-life. Uh, life comes only from life. And so, you know, God created Adam, uh, the Latin term is ex nihilo, from oh, no. nothing. That's right. From nothing. He, he made this man out of the dirt of the earth. Uh, the earth itself and breathe life into his nostrils. That is something that mankind cannot duplicate. We cannot reproduce. Um, God could anytime he wanted to, but God does not have to. God does not have to prove himself to us. In fact, all we have to do is walk outside and look around, or for that matter, look in the mirror. Uh, because we were created in the image and likeness of God. Um, and, and But by faith, we believe what the Bible tells us. So as the writer of Hebrews reminded us then that God made everything from nothing. So God spoke, the universe came to be, God spoke, we came to be, and so forth. So in spite of then of what some people think, then the powerful work of God that happened does not con uh, contradict uh, the so-called scientific evidence that people are looking for today. Uh, Faith helps us understand the how uh, and why behind all of that. 
Mm-hmm. But it gives us the confidence that God's going to continue to do his work, though, uh, in, in our world and in our lives as we go through it. I remember some good arguments in the movie Guys Like That, from way back in Guys Like That, too. I can't which one, just about this, about the origin of the universe and how you can believe in something that something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. And there was some good arguments in that movie about that. Yeah. It's funny because we, we believe ex nihilo, uh, like Jim was just um, talking about, you know, creating man from dust. But the other side of that would be evolution, you know, and they believe more or less the same thing. You know, they believe in a big bang uh, that created everything from nothing. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, but what's out of God? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, when you say they believe the same thing, you mean they're cohesive in their argument, they don't believe the same thing as we do. No, right. but they believe that a Big Bang just came out of nowhere mm-hmm. um, and created everything just over a extremely long period of time. Like yeah, said. so somebody one time commented on that, and, and, and the, the quote was fuzzy, but it was something like uh, the Big Bang theory would be like a tornado going through a junkyard and creating a 747. Yeah. You cannot take order and create order from chaos. Yeah. You simply can't do it. Um, and more and more doctors, more and more scientists, the more they study science, if you will, the more they study the human body, the more they study the cosmos, the universe, they're coming to believe in God. Anthony Flew was, uh, he was the atheistic uh, poster boy for years. And one of my professors from Liberty University, Gary Habermas, used to debate Dr. Flew quite a bit. And right up at, to the very end of his life, he held on to atheism until finally uh, Habermas, I, I, I'm not going to say converted him because he never put trust in Jesus, but he finally had to admit, yes, there, there has to be a creator. Uh, there was just no other, he just, there was just no other option for him. Um, other than yes, there had to be an initial cause that caused all this. Um, and, and I think that the more that people study the evidence, the more convinced they'll be. That's right. But we believe not because of evidence, we believe because of faith. That's it. We have faith in God, we have faith in his spoken word, uh, we have faith in what he has done in our lives, what we have seen. Um, and, and that makes all the difference. Uh, whatever your worldview is will drive how you behave, how you be, how you react, and, and what you what you believe in your life, or what's really important to you. Um, any other thoughts on that before we move on to verse 4? Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I, I can tell you that I would love for my epitaph to say something like that. I would, I would love that, uh, that God commended him by accepting his gifts. That would be a wonderful thing. Um, the, these introductory words that we see here, by faith, uh, it not only introduced the main theological point of the chapter, but also the structure and the text. And it, and it provides a, a really a powerful rhetorical device that gets our attention. Uh, he repeats, by faith, by faith. And uh, I think that there is sometimes a, a danger that we get into, particularly as evangelicals, is that we moralize Old Testament stories where we'll say things like, you know, be like Moses, don't be like Pharaoh. Well, Moses was a murderer. Yeah, Moses hit the rock twice and sit on the, had to sit on the mountain and watch him walk into the promised land. So we can't moralize these stories because what these, what these stories are doing, even though there is a moral lesson to be found in Bible stories, uh, they're not the main point. Uh, the main point comes from the context of the gospel, and that's what we should. Oh, that's how we should always read the Bible, with that in mind. Um, 
that we draw application from their lives, but more importantly, they walk by faith. Uh, I believe that's really what what the author of Hebrews, I believe that's what God is trying to tell us here. So we're able. Uh, why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? Because it was real. Um, Abel offered his um, gift to God, knowing that it was all it was what he had. It was all he had, or the best he had. I guess a better word for it. It was the best that he had. So he wanted to give the best they could to God. And it was their attitudes, the book says. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just goes to show that God knows. God knows our hearts. He knows what motivates us and what uh, what pushes us to do the things that we do. Um, and that is why Abel's offering of praise was was something God accepted and um, and he rejected. Cain's offering because he knew what was truly in Cain's heart. Right. It says in uh, Genesis 4 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And, and, and God told him, listen, don't act out in your anger, but he did. Mm -hmm. And so the first man that had a belly button, so I'm thinking about that for a second, <laughs> uh, killed his little brother. See, he had he had a heart that was not inclined to worship. Now, there's nothing wrong with bringing the the fruits. Uh, because not everybody was a shepherd. Some people were farmers. And so God still uh, did desire the first fruits of the harvest. So there was nothing wrong with him bringing that, that harvest to God, but it was his heart. That's it. Mm -hmm. It was what was in his heart. And, you know, uh, Paul says that, that that we should be generous and cheerful givers when we tithe. Uh, and I think that's a very important uh, principle for us to follow. You may, you may tithe, you may double tithe, you may give God 90%, but if you're giving it reluctantly with a hateful heart, I'm only giving because I have to. Um, I, I think that that person uh, really should do some business with the Lord because is that is that an acceptable offering that's a sweet aroma in the nostrils of God? God doesn't want it. At that point. Well, it's God's anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, now there, there are some folks, I, I know the Bible doesn't tell us why uh, explicitly why uh, Cain's offering was not accepted. Uh, now, Hebrews 9 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So uh, Abel brought forward that, that first uh, born of the flock, and he he sacrificed it. In fact, Abel's sacrifice foreshadowed uh, what Christ would do. I'm sure that his mother uh, told him, you know, listen, uh, Daddy and I messed up big time. Uh, but God promised that the seed of a woman would crush the head of the serpent. And so even then, I'm sure that Abel probably listened to his mom and, and brought that... Uh, that sacrifice that foreshadowed what Jesus would do. It was uh, it was a propitiatory sacrifice, uh, just as Jesus died as a propitiatory for our sins, a propitiation, I should say, um, where He died in our place. And uh, I think that's what Abel was doing. I think that he was foreshadowing the uh, the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, no. Kind of the point of the lesson we're going through today. I don't know if we said this earlier or not, but uh, we can confidently trust in what God says and does. Um, so, uh, in the case of uh, Cain and Abel's story back in Genesis chapter 4, um, Cain had no faith in God. As a result, he was offering more of a ritual, I think. Um, 
And so uh, it didn't mean much to God because you know it's a ritual, it's not a real thing in his life. So I think that our confidence that God alone is God and no one is like him affects our choices and actions. Um, so the truth is that there's uh, that there's no one greater than God, and He alone is worthy of the best that we have to give through this. So uh, I think, bottom line, we have to offer Him the best we have, in all in all ways, whether it be uh, through our worship, through our giving, through uh, serving in the church, whatever the case may be, we have to offer our best in all ways. Yeah. You said that the Cain brought his offering as a ritual. What's another word for ritual? I use it all the time. In my sermons, religion. Religion. Mm -hmm. So the first man with a belly button was the first guy that started a religion. Isn't that interesting? A ritual, a thing to do, a, a series of rules and regulations, a checklist. You know, hey, I got to do this because I got to do this, and that's not what God wants. Mm -hmm. He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. There's a question in the book. It says, "What's the relationship between faith?" and genuine worship and I circled the word genuine because that's the relationship <laughs> if, if, if your faith is not genuine then you're not going to have genuine worship and they go together so Cain acting in a ritualistic way uh, almost proves that he, his faith was either Falling away, or just just not there. Yeah, it was it was just a, a kind of a, a generic, superficial. You know, I'm going to do this because I need to. Not hey, I'm going to do this because I love God. And really, if, if you want to get right down to it, um, that that should always be the, the primary motivation for anything that we do in the name of Jesus. Uh, the Bible tells us to love God. Well, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, but it always starts with the first one. It always starts with loving God with everything that we have. And then everything flows out of that. For those people that uh, that serve, uh, and I know nobody at Oak Road does this, uh, but they serve because they want, you know, a picture in the paper, or they want a hat on the back, or they want, you know, a five-year service pen or something like that. Uh, I think that negates what they're doing. Um, because it's not really for the Lord. Uh, some of the the most uh, diligent servers and uh, people that work for the Lord are those people that are under the radar. You know, I, I remember Walter Price. Um, those pencils were always sharpened in those pews, and that was a what it, what it was a seemingly tiny little job that everybody would you know they would take for granted. Hey, our pencils are sharp. Um, Walter went on to heaven, and we got some dull pencils in this church. <laughs> uh, and, and I know that because occasionally I, I pull one out of the, the pew back to write a note in my Bible, and when I do, it's broken. And I'm like, okay, so in my pew where I sit, there's like five broken pencils next, to, you know, in the corner where I where I throw them down and grab another one. Uh, but Walter would come here during the week when no one was here, nobody saw him doing it, nobody knew. Nobody knew. Some people but God knew. Knew. Nobody knew. And he did that because he loved the Lord. And he loved his church. And he was very faithful. He was very faithful. He certainly was. Um, Speaking of faithful, I mean, it gets into Enoch next. Right, yeah, verse 5. And and it's, it's a, this is a cool part of the Bible. You know, back in Genesis, you're reading through these genealogies. You know, it just seems like everything's going on as, as usual. And then all of a sudden, um, Enoch, 365 years of age, just <coughs> disappeared. Yeah, God took him. He was raptured. Yeah. I thought his age was interesting. Yeah, when you talked about faith in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned, and I actually have a list here of different words in the Bible, and faith is one of them. In about 365 times. Yeah. Fear not, and, fear not, I think. Yeah, fear not, right. And fear not, but yeah. faith, faith also. And um, just so many of them, but here, he's 365 years old. Now, I know the ages mm -hmm. back then are different than they are today, but 365, and then all these different words in the Bible. 
Um, and of course, a year, 365 days. I mean, just the, the number just popped out. Like it that. does. It, it does pop out. Yeah, Genesis 5 21 through 24 says, When he met, had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, who was Methuselah? I know he was the oldest guy there really. No, that was Noah's dad. Or Noah's grandfather. Grandfather. Yeah. So Enoch was Noah's great grandfather. But he was raptured. He didn't see death. Um, kind of like Elijah. Mm -hmm. you know, Elijah did not die. A chariot of fire came down, picked him up, took him up to heaven. Uh, in fact, many people believe that the two that come back in Revelation, the two witnesses, are Enoch and Elijah. Now, we don't know that. I mean, there's all kinds of Moses, speculation of Moses. Moses. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if it's two of the three stooges. I, they're coming back and, and they're going to testify uh, to what the Bible says because the Bible is true. So again, as we said, it doesn't matter who the author, who the human author of Hebrews was, because uh, it's, it's it's dual authorship. There's a divine author, God, and then a human author that God uses. Um, but regardless of who these two men will be, it doesn't matter because God's going to use them for His purpose. Um, Enoch's faith honored God, and God commended him at the end that he shouldn't experience death. And really, this speaks to every Christian that has ever lived, that is alive now, or ever will live, because as believers, we will not experience death, because Jesus has already experienced it for us. Um, I think that uh, that, is the, that is the gospel tie-in, I think, that we see in this, that you and I uh, will not perish. We will have everlasting life. Uh, because of what Jesus has done. Faith honors God, and God honors faith. I would have loved to have known Enoch, like, just to, to see how he behaved, and what his, what his daily life was like. And that, uh, you know, we can understand that walking with God is, like, true faith. But, just to be able to, to witness him, I'm sure it would have been awesome. And, and honestly, you know, it, it explains why Noah had the faith that he had too, uh, because you, you get, you learn from your previous generation, mm -hmm. your, your grandparents and your parents, and it, it gets passed down. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I just think that's really neat. Um, to see that he was he was so faithful that God just said, you know what, come up here, come up here. I want to give you a hug and you can just stay with me. <laughs> you know? Well, now, you know Noah's faith. He spent a hundred years building a, a ship in a sand. We wrote a song about that, uh -huh. and it had rain. And so here he is out building this boat. <clears throat> People are probably like, what, what are you doing, bud? Oh, I'm building a boat because God's going to open up the heavens. Yeah. And it's going to come down, and they're like, "Yeah, right, you're crazy." Uh -huh. Hey, my my great grandpa is with God right now. Yeah. His name was Enoch, you know. So I mean, his legacy was already uh, making that a difference. And you know, five thousand years later, six thousand years, what, depending upon your timeline, um, it's still making a difference today uh, for us. Uh, the scripture says, "Without faith, <clears throat> it is impossible to please God." And I see, I see two truths in that. One, without faith, it's impossible to be commended. Um, that without faith in God, we will not uh, be commended before God. We can do things to be commended before man. We can be humanitarian. We can have great morals. We can follow ethical codes. But that's not going to bring us approval on Judgment Day. The second thing that I notice is that with faith, it is impossible to be condemned. I love that. Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And that's just a, that's a verse that I read and recite to myself a lot. Uh, our faith in Jesus um, tells us that the righteousness of Christ is credited to us regardless of what we've done and that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. I have a quote here from Charles Spurgeon about that verse, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we are without God, for God is only apprehended by faith. Without faith, we are without hope, for a true hope can only spring out of true faith. Without faith, we are without Christ, and consequently without a Savior. It would be infinitely better to be without eyes, without hearing, without wealth, without bread, without garments, without a home, rather than be without the faith that brings everything the soul requires. Without faith, we are spiritually naked, poor, miserable, lost, condemned, and without hope of escape. Say amen. So I think what, what I take away from all of this is that we, we look at these, these heroes of the faith, if you will, um, the, this list, and, and the list goes on. Uh, we're just not touching on all of them today. Um, the, the author talks about uh, Noah and Abraham, uh, different ones, uh, Isaac, Jacob, throughout the Bible, who, who expressed faith in God, who showed their faith in God, and uh, that we have a similar faith. Um, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice and resurrection gives us confidence in uh, the Lord and his ability to save us. So I think there's some questions on here. We want to leave everybody with that. Do you have those there? <coughs> How will you live out your faith this week? Uh, first of all, we thank God for our faith. Uh, we thank him for bringing us to faith in Christ and acknowledge our belief in him. And we always seek to please him in how we live. Um, that's, of course, super important. Always be thanking God. Uh, to walk in faith, which is what faith is, really, is walking with the Lord, um, and to walk in obedience to Christ, uh, following his word. Uh, always uh, make sure that we're reading his word. This is a great time uh, right now to, to really study up in the scriptures because uh, we find ourselves at home, um, you know, study up on our own, study up with our families, uh, you know, Men of God, teach your families, teach your children um, how to walk in faith and to be faithful to the reading of God's word um, and express your faith. And uh, when we have a, a faith life, uh, you know, we're commanded um, by Jesus himself to go and to make disciples and, and to baptize. Um, and that, that means we need to be sharing our faith. Uh, we have to be telling others about Jesus and about what he has done and, and what we have done, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and, um, and we need him. So those, those three points, thanking God, walking in faith, and expressing that faith um, in, in the Lord, that's what we need to be doing. And then the last part of that verse is, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Um, uh, one, one thing that I would like to leave everybody with, especially us, is that with what's going on in the world, how we respond to the coronavirus, to this social distancing, to this lockdown, this ban, shelter in place, all this kind of stuff, it's going to speak volumes to people that are watching us. Um, do we live our lives in faith of God's promises? Uh, or do we live a, a life of fear? And we, God's word is never return void. 
<clears throat> and God will always, uh, he will always accomplish what his word is set forward to accomplish. We don't understand why this is going on, but how we react to this uh, pandemic is going to say a lot about our faith in God. And ultimately, is going to talk to those that are watching us about the character of God and what God truly means to us. What, you know, why do we have faith in Jesus? Why is it important to us? And at a time like now, I think that speaks volumes to an unbelieving world. We have a great opportunity uh, to be evangelistic. And I don't think it's any, uh, I don't believe in, uh, in, you know, consequential things. I don't believe in uh, coincidences. And I believe that in January, when God spurred us to begin this Who's Your One sermon series about identifying that one person we need to be sharing our faith with, God knew this, this pandemic was coming. Uh, he knew it. And uh, I believe that time is short. I believe that we've been in the end time since Acts 1 8. As soon as Jesus ascended, the angels said, in the middle of Galilee, why are you standing around here staring up into the heavens? The same Jesus who ascended will come back. So we've always been in the end times. Um, and uh, I, I believe that we have a great opportunity right now to uh, to help do our part and, and, and a great harvest for the kingdom and, and sharing the gospel and letting people see our faith. And uh, I think... You know, just to follow up with that, a you know, sense of urgency is important. You know, because even the people back in the Bible days, uh, I think, well, I think it might be Thessalonians. You know, they were afraid that they missed. Yeah, you know, they thought it already happened. They, they thought it already happened. I mean, it could happen anytime. Um, it could happen right this very moment. So that sense of urgency to to share the gospel is there. Amen. You have to be intentional about that. Any other closing thoughts? No, I'll pray for Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for Abel, and we thank you for Enoch, and we thank you for Abraham and Noah and Isaac and Jacob. We thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for our sins, who victoriously rose from the dead, who has already uh, tasted death so we never would have to. We praise you for the salvation that comes through your grace, through our faith in you. I pray God for each and every person that's listening uh, to this right now. I pray for their families. I uh, lift up our staff, our church, our community, our state, our nation, and this world to you, Father. And I pray, Lord, that your word says that all things work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So take this pandemic, Lord, and use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.